We made this. Welcome to the Starlight Ballroom. Hey. Hello and welcome to Shipwrecked and Comatose, a Red Dwarf podcast right here on the We Made This podcast network. We are rocketing straight into series two of our podcast and my name's mark i am one of your regular hosts with me at this time is kurt north hello kurt hello 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 welcome are we going to have a full season discussing androids is my question i mean we could but we're not going to Oh, okay. <laughs> also with us is Carl Bryan. Hello, Carl. Hello there. How are you doing today? I'm all right. Welcome back to Series 2, mate. Hi. Ah, looking forward to it. So, uh, it's it's going to be nice to get back to the main continuity after the, uh, the American pilots. They were certainly interesting. Yes, they were. <laughs> they, they were. And um, I, I like the recasting, Carl. Because uh, there, was a, there was a certain cast member that you placed into the uh, into the show, I did, and I was like, "That's not that person." <laughs> I was shouting at the podcast, going, "No, I did." <laughs> I would like to officially apologise for that on this episode before I get torn. Well, I've probably already been torn apart for this after it got broadcast. I said that Jerry Ryan was cast as the uh, cat in the second episode, and I meant Terry Farrell. Uh, I got it backwards, and. Uh, I went into an alternative universe where Jerry Ryan got cast instead for that moment, then I do apologise, and I'm fully willing to accept my punishment of being sent to the tank. (laughs) So so here's the thing, right? I always crack the really tasteless joke that, because I'm gay, all women look the same to me. But Carl, what's your excuse? I got my my Star Trek actresses mixed up. Uh, I mean, Star Trek, fair enough. Yeah. So hey, I'm sorry that. about that. Not that, Mark. Not <laughs> that. I'm sorry. Yes, we're on a pod- we're on a podcast network where there's what twelve Star Trek shows now. <laughs> Shit. I mean, ooh, uh, yeah. Star Trek's great. I, I, I love all of them, not just the Next Generation. And Jerry Ryan's on the one that I actually um, podcast about as well. But um, Terry Farrell, <laughs> <I didn't>, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. I've not watched but Terry Terry, Far- T- Terry Farrell growing up, um, who was the one that played the cat in the USA one. Um, I had a thing for when I was growing up anyway. So it was um it was more it was more me shouting at the screen going, No, no, no. And I can imagine many a Red Dwarf or Star Trek fan just shouting at, at Carl and uh, I hope the abuse wasn't too much, um, Carl, and hope you hope you survived. As uh, as people know we're recording this before um before it goes out. So it'll be interesting to see the if anyone picks up on it or not. We might not even get any feedback, so you'll see. Hopefully I said it quick enough that nobody noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Can we not just like record you saying Terry Farrell and 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 use the wonders of modern technology to put it in? It could be a bit like one of those badly dubbed things. Huh? Carl talks some about <laughs> Terry Farrell. No, <laughs> Jimmy Henry. I think that would be brilliant. <laughs> if if you record it, Kurt, with a slight tinge of anger in your voice, and then just go over the top of what I said. <laughs> yeah, Jared, just but let you have the Jerry Ryan. Terry Farrell. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Jerry Ryan. Terry Farrell. In fact, Kurt, do that. Do that. Okay. Do a little edit and say, Kurt, th- hello, this is Kurt. I listened to this. Carl is wrong. He's, he's apologised. It's Terry Farrell. And then cut it and just crudely paste it in the middle. I think that would be really funny. <laughs> I'll, I'll give it if I get time. Or well, it's a, it's a, it's not out for a week, is it? So I might have time to do it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> That's really anyway. <laughs> we digress. We do. We're, we're at series two. So, funnily enough, we're looking at series two of Red Dwarf, and that starts with Crichton, series two, episode one. And the first thing that made me think was, I could have sworn that Crichton was like introduced later than this, and of course he wasn't. He was just kind of like sat around the ship for the whole of Series 2, and they never talked about him again. And then he reappeared in Series 3. Well, it's... I mean, he's... uh, He goes... Jumping ahead a little bit to the end of the episode, he goes off to uh, find his garden, doesn't he? He he takes the space bike and and disappears, and that's how he he comes back, is that he he crashes. 
and list to fix him. It's in the big long scroll that we get to at the start of series yeah. three. Um, but yeah, so Crichton does head off into the, the wild blue yonder and comes back immediately. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, were, they, they, were, they were kind of against having, um, you've mentioned this in, in on several occasions about the not having aliens and, and the thought that the sci-fi trope of having a robot was, wasn't there. So it was more like a, I, I don't know if it was the case, but more like a producer's thing saying you've got to put in a robot and they've kind of threw Crichton in and then suddenly realised, oh, well, hang on a second, that episode actually worked quite well. And uh, and the, the idea of four rather than three came kind of came across and, uh, you know, and then obviously they're bringing back for season three and, and David Ross, unfortunately, and I'm sure we'll talk about this in season three, wasn't available due to scheduling. So we get uh, the marvellous Robert Llewellyn. So We were fortunate, really. I mean, it's not like the guy who played Crichton in this was bad. It's just that Robert Llewellyn was, well, frankly, sublime. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think another thing as well, because um, I don't know whether in terms of, of cost, but the the suit for this episode took eight hours to put on. And I can imagine in terms of a shooting schedule, that will just really, really slow you down. So I can imagine the idea, they might have been quite hesitant to have kept Crichton on initially until maybe the te- the makeup technology was more speedier, basically. Anyway, let's get into it. We start with the classic theme. And again, I wanted to talk about this. As a kid, I hadn't seen the first two series before. I, I think the first series I saw was either four or five because my access was basically through VHS. And um, so I was really confused as a kid because in my head, series one and series two came after series the, the series I'd seen with the more modern theme tune. And um, I was just wondering if either of you have any weird Red Dwarf nuances from your childhood? I the same, in that my first episode, my first series was four that I ever saw every week on the telly. And I did the same as you, as I, I went back through the VHSs because they weren't going to repeat series one and two. So when I first heard the original theme, I actually thought it was quite ominous. Um, just instead of going from the dun-dun-dun-dun-dun to this slower, more methodical theme, I was like, oh, right, okay. But I did think that the uh, what is supposed to be Lister painting the ship uh, was a really cool... Um, title sequence and not one that i don't think got used a great deal that sort of method of a slow title sequence everything else i can imagine at the time was probably very jolly and sort of this and then we've got this slow almost menacing music and one slow shot of the establishment if you think about what we've had with uh, around that time I, i'm i'm not right with my ears here because it's you know i haven't done any research on this but You've got to think of the sitcoms around this time, which would have been things like Waiting for God or, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, it would have been very, very different. And, um, you know, as you say, having that dark, ominous, you know, sci-fi dystopian kind of, um, you know, minor key kind of stuff is uh, is an interesting way of going. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's something that I, that I would pick up. And I know, Carl, you mentioned in the in the specials as well that um, the, the Holly... Um, you know the different versions of Holly as well, and I ca- I think I watched the ones I watched was with um, with Hattie rather than Norman, and uh, it it was a it was a bit of a it took me a while to work out what exactly happened there because I don't think I remember literally reading that scroll too much later on. You know, properly reading it, mm. I used to just watch the show as just as the episodes and often wonder what was the change there, and I just thought they just changed it, but there's obviously stories behind it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it, conf- it confused me initially because, as I've said before, I, my first series was with Hattie Hayridge. And to me, she looked more um, sci-fi in her out with the hair and the sort of the sort of China white skin and the red lipstick. Then, then all of a sudden, it flipped back, and I saw Norman Lovett, and it. He he didn't look as sci-fi, but then I rem- as I've watched it more, obviously that's the joke, is that he doesn't look particularly computer-like, even though he is the greatest uh, lover that ever lived. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I think you're right, though. She she looks kind of like your classic 50s pulp kind of sci-fi, doesn't she? Mm. In that, yeah. uh, to make a very dated reference, I think, is it Servalan from Blake 7 with a sort of very severe straight-edged haircut and... And things like that is. I'm not. I wasn't a big Blake Simmons fan. I watched a bit of it just from looking into more sci-fi stuff from earlier on at the time. But I do remember that that was very much the style in sci-fi and sort of women with um, almost extreme haircuts. Yeah. Well, they pick that up again, don't they? In um, Cassandra. Yeah. In in that episode in season eight, that's kind of got that feel to it as well, and. I know pre slightly different, and uh, we won't talk about pre because Carl. I know you've now watched the uh, the Dave stuff, but I know that that um, Mark hasn't. You see, so, I'm uh, thinking I'm not going to, and I'm going to watch them as like a first time for when we watch them. I think that might work nicely. Yeah, I think it'd be nice. I think that now that Carl's watched it, it gives us a bit more scope to be able to bring him in for episodes. Yeah. Um, but having, I think Mark, you know, if if we can keep you away from it. I think it'd be it'd be fantastic purely for, for that reason. So you're watching them as we're recording, yeah. You know, to get your first first kind of view on them because that'd be really interesting. But going back to um, going back to Holly, this was the the season where they decided to stop pixelating him as well. They actually stopped pixelating him and just had him on screen because of that beautiful face. It's, it's like Norman Lovett always said, you know, that's where the money's at. You know, <laughs> point the camera at that. <laughs> Talking about Holly, we get the classic series one and two Holly recap, and he cracks the gag that they're alone in a meaningless universe, but still, you've got to laugh, which is a nice start, because I did indeed laugh at the first gag of series two. As I say, this this has been used as well to describe the series, I think, in, in following years, because it really does sum it up quite well. In that it's re- this massively pointless situation, but they're still going to have a chuckle at it because there's nothing else to do. Yeah, I, well, I think that 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 is almost. It's, we're talking about like sort of phrases that we use a lot, and I think that I, I've used that quite a lot in, in my normal world. It's like, well, well, you've got to laugh, haven't you? You know, at the end of the day, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the uh, came the genesis of that came from him saying that because it's. It is that deadpan, dry humour. And to be fair, the friends that I've got around me are very deadpan and, and can come across as arrogant in some ways when, when we're actually out because we're very, very deadpan and, that, and that's our type of humour. So um, so Norm, Norman Levitt is, is, our, is our god, I think. He's just brilliant. <laughs> He's just brilliant. And <laughs> the thing is, we were talking about Hattie Hayridge and Norman Lovett. They're both brilliant. It's so It's so important to say that Hattie was was great as well and we were really fortunate really because imagine if she'd been cack yeah yeah the show starts with a planet that shows a crashed rocket and um it then moves inside the rocket and Crichton is inside watching his favorite robot soap androids and um yeah that's clearly the neighbor's theme isn't it Carl it is <laughs> How they got away with it, I'm not particularly sure. Because I think this this must have been when Neighbours was in full. Like it, it can't have been on air for long, so it must have been in its full like initial burst of popularity. But yeah, I'm, I'm I mean, it was a good gag because everybody recognised that theme tune straight away. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And um, I, I I loved Neighbours as a kid. It was. Ugh. And thinking about it, it's not so nice anymore. But it was um, Rolf's Cartoon Club followed by by Neighbours every week. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, thank you for reminding me about that, Mark. Yeah, thanks for. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. You know, I'm I'm quite happy to ruin your childhood for you. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> but the, what, I, what I quite like. Uh, sorry. Uh, what what I quite liked about. Um, the Android theme tune as well is, and this is just on a, on a pure um, kind of primal level for today, is that um, Androids have feelings too. And that I had that song wrapping around my head when I sent the message to you boys this morning going, I'm ready, and I had nothing back from you. <laughs> I was silent. I was like, 15 minutes later, I was like, where, where are they? Where are they? I'm feeling quite, I'm quite, quite lonely and, you know, I've got some feelings, you know. I, I was in bed because <laughs> I forgot we were recording this morning. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I did message Mark this morning going, still recording at 10, and then there's a pause, and then I saw the little dots come, and then the first word was, yikes! 
Was it yikes? It was, was it yikes. It, yeah. it was actually yikes. I am that camp, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about as camp as Crichton. Anyway, so it moves back to Red Dwarf, and they're in their quarters, where Rimmer is learning Esperanto. Lister is doing better at it, despite the fact that Rimmer's been learning for eight years. We learn that Lister went to art college for 97 minutes while he's polishing his space bike. It's all very kind of mundane and reminding you of the kind of slow pace of what their lives must be in this empty universe, don't you think? It does. One of the things I picked up from this scene, and I think it goes through the episode a few times, is something we've mentioned before is realising the potential that Lister has in that he's picked up Esperanto more than Rimmer just by hearsay, basically, and just almost by uh, uh, passive learning by just being near Rimmer when Rimmer's been really trying and he still can't pick it up. But also Esperanto is essentially a language that never really took off. And it, it just amuses me that the whole ship, all the signs are in Esperanto and uh, they're learning Esperanto for no reason because they're not going to run into anybody who who listens to us, who speaks Esperanto. No, no, they're not. And um, then... You- we are about a minute into the episode and Mark's quotable red dwarf rears its head with, I hope when you come, the weather will be clement. I say this all the time when I'm meeting up with friends. I will say to them, I hope when you come, the weather will be clement. And people either get it and laugh or look at me funny. I realised in, in my ongoing quest of, of rediscovering things that I do use in conversation and didn't realize it comes from red dwarf i do use the phrase you can still taste the toothpaste <laughs> all right yeah yeah the the, the tall 30 in the afternoon that 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 to be fair that is totally me <laughs> <laughs> that line it's like uh, no i didn't i don't want to go to university because the first classes are not till uh, at 12 30 in the afternoon i can't get up that early um, but yeah, that 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 the two face line is great, and and I say the rim, the weather might be clement isn't one I would na- naturally pick out actually, but it's interesting you say that, Mark, because it's not not one that I would naturally go to. I really like it. I think it's just silly in, in a really silly way, more formal than I would ever naturally speak, and therefore I quite like it as a kind of deliberate, um, <clears throat> as a kind of deliberate transgression to the way i would normally talk i mean I, I'm, I'm similarly would i guess it's no not dissimilar to greeting people with yo because you know i'm a 41 year old homosexual white guy i wouldn't naturally greet people with yo so therefore i take great delight in doing that you know yeah 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 totally good <laughs> to talking slightly separate from that is the um there's a phrase in the town that i work in because i don't live i don't live in the same town i work in i'm about 20 miles away via, via car on the motorway and um they they say mega a lot so i kind of use that as a way of like not 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 pushing them down but kind of using it as a terminology for me to say look i'm not from round here it's all mega isn't it kind of thing so it's <laughs> just purely because it's it's against the grain with them oh i haven't used mega in years i need to start saying mega more that i miss that that's <laughs> while you're at it i might i might pick up um wicked again cuz that's from my childhood oh that's wicked no Oh, I found myself saying banging <laughs> more often the other day. So, is that all right? Yeah, that's all right. Banging. I, I don't know where it came from, but I've just started saying banging more. Uh, another one that's probably going to get picked up in this in this series and maybe future is brutal. When Lister starts saying yeah. brutal, I thought that was a really cool expression at the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It is so fundamentally quotable. And I like how I've picked up something that I still use in regular conversation today, but you wouldn't have picked up Kurt. Whereas previously we've all kind of remembered specific lines and we might use them more than each other, but you you understand what I'm getting at? It's even Mm. getting to the point where it's becoming very personal that that there's so much in there that we've all got our own favorite little lines that we still quote 25 years on. 
a, th- a thing as well I, I've noticed, and this goes in with what's this Esperanto section, is because it was on BBC Two, and because essentially they couldn't swear that often, I think it, it probably influenced a lot of us in terms of coming up with creative insults. Like the the one on here was that your father is a baboon's rump and your mother spent half of her time up against walls with sailors. No, perfectly clean, but a really cutting insult. It's uh, I and I think that's I think that's influenced myself, especially in the you know why swear when you can come up with something creative. And I think a lot of other sitcoms at the time, like say, were probably doing that. It'd probably be you know they. A lot of sitcoms in the present day would probably just have sworn or something like that, but not Red Dwarf because they couldn't. But they use that into a character trait almost of Rimmer that he's got these long uh, diatribes of insults. Same as Blackadder. Blackadder doesn't have any swearing in as far as I'm aware. And that's got some of the best insults you'll have ever seen in comedy. True. Um, True. So Holly interrupts their fascinating Esperanto lesson, and um, Rimmer points out that they're bored. Holly adds to this by saying that he's added two notes to music, which are, I think they were bow and row, were they, or something? Woe and bow. bow. Woe and bow, sorry. <laughs> Do you know what? I like the scientific accuracy of it, though? It's say from an octave to a dec- to dec- dec- decimalised it by two points. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, I, I know it's crew, but the, but it gets me every time. So the, the women are going to be banned from the cello. It's just like an amazing line, and it's like okay, that's fine. Um, but it just and the fact that you, you can totally tell that Norman Levitt's reading it when he's um, when he's going through it as well. It's, it's incredible. I just I just think it's uh, it's it's a wonderful gag, and mm. uh, you know it, it just. It, it's just amazing that he's that bored that he's said, well, do you know what? I'm going to change it and I'm going to call it whole rock as well, which is, uh, which is incredible. I think it's a, it's a great, it's a great reintroduction to Holly actually yeah. for, you know, for a second season audience. I think it's actually a great reintroduction to all three of these characters. And um, perhaps it's not quite as good a reintroduction to, maybe it is for the cat where they find him. Oh, where uh, Holly says that they, they, they found a signal and then the boys go and collect cat on the way cats kind of looking for a mouse and it's it's just not quite as as funny when they collect the cat i didn't think i think it's very cat like though that when when they do get him they're like oh you know oh come on he sort of acts a little bit like oh i'm not coming with you and then he's blatantly starts running after them um i think one thing that's worth mentioning in this reintroduction is how much more color there is in terms of everybody's got more colorful clothing on uh the sets have got more color in they've they've obviously looked at it and got i know they've they've mentioned that the gray tends to last through series one and two but just from this initial one you can really see a lot more it's a lot more striking visually but more con more contrast there's more contrast to it yeah absolutely i think they've made an effort not quite enough effort but they have made an effort which isn't acknowledged normally yeah i think as well i think from this series onwards you see a real leap in the cat's wardrobe as well it was all the zoot suits in the first series and then from here on he's he's got in some episodes he's got sort of two different outfits and they're all, I mean, they're very 90s or late 80s, early 90s, but they're fantastic. We'll get to the one of them in a minute. but <laughs> yeah. So they get to the control room and the distress call is from Nova 5 and um, they are running low on supplies. Crichton appears on screen asking for help and says there are three survivors and there are they are all women. Rimmer bigs himself up and says he's the captain and that he'll help out. And they're 24 hours away. And at this point, Lister emphasises they're definitely not on the pull. I one. This is one of my favourites. Is when Chris Barry goes into the the hero voice with the fear not. I'm the bloke who used to clean the gunk out of the chicken soup machine. And, <laughs> and the fun bit about it is he's right. You know, if if you came across somebody looking for help, you you wouldn't tell them that that's what you were. You know, it's sort of because they're immediately like, "Oh, we're screwed." We've 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 run the, the first people we've come across, and they're chicken soup machine repair people. 
Yeah, I, I can't imagine anyone not um, basically saying that, can you? you? You you would you would either just avoid it altogether and just like you know say, oh, we'll come and help you, kind of thing. But you definitely wouldn't say, oh, yes, by the way. Just so you know, we're bums. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this, th- right, I, looking through my notes, I actually think this could be the most quoted episode of Red Dwarf in my head because going through it, there's five or six things that are still very kind of regular in my life and only 24 hours and first in the shower room are definitely things I say. If, um, you know, if I've got like a deadline, I'll be like, only 24 hours. And if um, and if like I'm going out with with friends or whatever, I will also quote first in the shower room. And um, I, I just fucking love the cat, don't I? You do. <laughs> you do. I don't know if anyone's got this yet. I mean, we're what? Maybe eleven episodes, twelve episodes <laughs> into the podcast. <laughs> I think people may have got that mark. <laughs> He's so slinky. It, he's so slinky in the way he moves. When he sort of glides out of the door and then glides back in to say all six of his nipples are tingling. Um, yeah. And then just, it's it's almost like he's not walking. He's on like a treadmill. He's he's so smooth. I mean, and I, I can imagine a lot of that is from Danny John Jules' dance background. But he's he's so perfect in the role. As as we said, I I got caught up on all the Dave stuff. And he's still, you know, even this, this far, I think they're, they're all in their sort of 50s by this point. He's still so lithe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the Dave stuff that, yeah, the, the, the Dave stuff, I mean, he's, as you say, the dancing, the kind of on point, you know, he knows how to like, you know, he, he uses his body. He's not like staccato in a way. He's not that kind of dancer. He's more of a, you know, a musical background. So it's rather than being like, say, a beatbox or a break dance or, lock and pop and stuff like that he, he's very much a glider mm. so and that and that really works and i know there's a bit of michael jackson in there occasionally in bits and bobs but um that goes to how you know how, how that that influence influences the system as well but as i say as, as carl said there the latest stuff he's still got it and he's and he and it still is needed because it, it works to a really good effect and it actually em- emphasizes the 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 joke that's on on display at that time so the fact that he can still do that at whatever age he's at now is uh, is really really good. And as 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 Carl said, you know, I'm I'm looking forward to hearing mm. hearing your reactions to the Dave stuff. So yeah. that, that's all great. I mean, when he was on, was it Dancing with the Stars? He was on, or yeah. he Strictly was on come, Strictly Come Dancing. It, when I heard he got announced for that, I I initially thought, well, that's not fair because he's got years of dance and musical. I was surprised he that he didn't win. Because uh, he's he's a fantastic dancer. <laughs> I initially thought he was going to go from being, oh, he'll probably finish in the top ten, what everybody else would have thought. And I'm like, no, he's the one to watch. So I was very surprised he didn't win that because he's blatantly a fantastic dancer. Mm. Did, did he, did he yeah. do well? He got about halfway through, I think. But there was a, he didn't want to come back afterwards. Um, because I think he he made some he made a bit of a stink at the time that he was. I think it was cons- a conspiracy that he was voted off, but uh, I think he might have just been a bit. Obviously, as a as a trained dancer, if I lost to someone from, say, Geordie Shaw in a dancing competition, I'd be a bit annoyed as well. Mm, true. Yeah, well, that, that that's a thing with those programs, isn't it? Because you know, so the, the underdogs are the people who who are the most, um, you know. And I don't mean this from Danny Don Jules' point of view because he's obviously a very funny guy and a very good dancer, but from a public perception at maybe the time he was there yes he's well known but you know he's not uh, a new re- reality tv star or an mp who can't physically dance you mm. know he's he's so he's someone who's probably middle of the road in in that regard because you know he's a trained dancer he, well he should be doing that you know it, it, and where do the, where does his fan base come from mm. and i know it would be red dwarf but would they would they uh, really kind of push that Push that out there, really. Yeah, there's not a lot of crossover between Strictly and Red Dwarf fan base wise. I don't think. Well, no, I don't watch Strictly, and I, I actually quite like to dance as well. But um, you know, I mean, for a number of different reasons, I don't watch it purely one purely because, like, like Mark, I'm out on a weekend generally with wedding gigs and stuff. But um, but even so, it's not something that that really floats my boat with that. Mm. 
So we enter the wonderful getting ready montage where Lister is hammering his socks, ironing his trousers, spraying over the hole in his trousers. And um, this music plays in my head every time I'm in a rush. (laughs) Every time I'm rushing to get ready for something, this music hits my brain and I suppose it could be worse. It's so it's such a simple bit of music, but it's so effective, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a walk, it's a walking bass line, and I'm a bass player, so for, for that for a start off, it's great. <laughs> um, but uh, what I like about it actually is because it's it's very slapstick, it's very kind of you know unreal. Because <laughs> uh, even to the point where I think, for me personally, this is the first time that I felt that they were playing off the audience. Because you mentioned that bit with the the jeans and the back pocket. It was like he was spraying that until the laugh kind of sort of started to wane, and then he then he kept, stepped out of it. So it was almost like the timing was like with the audience rather than it being a line. Now, yes, you've got me too, which was a bit maybe a bit different, but this one to me is the one that kind of recalls the most. Where yes, it was it was ridiculous. <laughs> you know, it's it's no way this would ever work, <laughs> but at the same time. That, that Craig Charles is playing off the audience, and, and and that's what that's what I get from this episode every time I see it. it I think there's a certain, there's a definite feeling of they're feeling a lot more comfortable in what they're doing this series. There's a confidence, isn't there? Yeah, the reveal of the hole in the back of the jeans, I thought was great in the fact that he managed to um, keep that hidden from the audience until he turned round. Yeah, which and yeah, the blocking was really good on it. Yeah. From that and when Rimmer walks in, you can tell that Chris Barry is waiting for the laugh to die down before delivering his line. Mm, mm. Mm. So, yeah, Rimmer walks in and um, he's in full regalia and he he basically takes the piss out of Lister, who responds. And Rimmer responds to that by saying that um, he always puts him down in front of girls and um, asks him to um, not do that this time. He suggests that perhaps he might call him Ace or Big Man, yeah. and um, and um, the, he also mentions that no one ever called him Ace, despite how many times he let them beat him up. And um, I think that's it was really funny, and then suddenly it was really sad, and that one kind of hit me quite hard. Did you feel as strongly about that, Kerr? Well, the 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 thing that. I think in hindsight, hearing the word ace for for, for a start of it's like you, like I've just said there, it's like yeah, mm. because you know what's coming, and you know that they, they you, you mentioned about the the fact that you know that's the way you got beaten up and and things like that, and and strangely enough, I was thinking about this as we've been recording, like maybe five ten minutes ago, that um, I, I think I've mentioned that I think throughout the, the actual seasons we're going to um, relate in some way to certain things. I, I was I was bullied as, as a as a kid at school, and you know it took me a while to um, to actually t- end up turning around and try to punch the lad. You know what I mean? It took me ages. They, they pulled at my hair one point, and I, I lost it completely. Good. But I've got a high th- I got a high threshold of of like being able to take stuff like that because I just it, it's water off a duck's back to me, and it didn't really affect me. But it was just the relentlessness of mm. it. So the fact that yeah, you know, so yes, there is that relatability with with what Rimmer's going through there, and I think it adds depth to the character. And I think that the first two episodes here really started like add depth to Rimmer because I think that as much as we've talked about last season about how he's up and down, and you know, I'm sure we'll talk about um, this towards the end of this episode that. Um, we do, we do find, you know, we we need that balance. You know, you need that balance. Uh, I think you mentioned it in the specials where you were talking about the the American version was all the the rough parts of Rimmer put in with none of the the emp- empathy and none of the, yeah, we did the the other things that m- make it deeper. And it, this this scene particularly does that in the way that it makes you feel for him, but it also sets up the gag later on. And it up while also deepening Rimmer's character, and I think it does a really good job of all three, um, all in the space of a couple of seconds, ten fifteen seconds of of dialogue. Mm, mm. It's it, it's a real insight into his sadness and his paranoia and the the depth of the character that is kind of Weasley for laughs, but there's also a real kind of 
background to why he's like that. I think the first three episodes of this series, this one better than life and, and thanks for the memory lay a lot of, of groundwork for um, the backstories on a lot of, of, of Rimmer and Lister definitely. Um, yeah. Especially with the parents. Yes. As, as a larger gentleman, I have, I've been called big man normally by when I used to work in pubs, if I ever was telling someone to to get out, um, I used to get I used to hear a drunk call me big man in a t- as a term of trying to soften me up a bit, so I'd let them stay. And so yeah, that that uh, I used to work for a lad I used to call big man as well. Mm. Do you think it came from Red Dwarf? Because I'm pretty sure me using big man to um, dis- you know fondly describe people definitely comes from this. Yeah, I think it came from this for me as well. <laughs> so um, we move on where just after Rimmer suggests that Lister wear his Mingy moon boots and um, we're back at the crash rocket and F- Crichton is flustered. And then there's the big reveal that the women are all skeletons. Yes, just before just before we get to that bit, I just want to bring it up. Is Mister uh, probably one of the best uh, sections I think there is in any Red Dwarf episode, which is they've run out of milk. This this is probably one of Norman Lovett's best bits I think in the entire series. Just the delivery and the timing on you know we dogs' milk lasts longer than any other type of milk. Why? Because no bugger will drink it. <laughs> And I didn't want to spoil. I didn't want to spoil it <laughs> as well. There's the deadpan line when he says, "I didn't want to spoil it." Why didn't you tell me? Well, I didn't want to spoil you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the thing is, I've, I've missed that, but that's because this this episode is so tight and the gags are so constant and brilliant that I didn't. I, mean, I think it, I've got it in my notes, but I've skipped past it because there's so much to talk about in one 28 minute episode. It's really packed. It's, I think, because oh, I think this is the first time, is this the first time we go off ship? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, because it's the first time First time we see Blue Midget. First yeah. time we see Blue Midget. It's our first planet as well that we see. The models are beautiful in this episode. The, the model of the Nova 5 crash looks fantastic. And Blue Midget's great well, too. Well, yeah, I was going to say, is it the first planet? Or, well, the the one last season was a moon, wasn't it, where... Or oh, am I thinking season two? They go off onto a moon, don't That's they? That's thanks for the memory where they go drinking. Is it? Yeah. Uh, maybe I'm thinking season two, yeah. Okay. Yeah, cause it, yeah. Well, I think it yeah, will be then. Yeah, it'll be the first time Blue Midget, first time off-planet, off, off planet, yeah. Off um, Red Dwarf. And then, so the, um, the, the, the smelly boots are stinking out Blue Midget and Cat arrives in a gold space suit and Holly is wearing a toupee. Um, Rimmer's got rolled up socks in his trousers. They're all clearly not on the pull. The the boots. I've never seen a more accurate visual representation of something stinking. Yeah. You look at them and just go, oh, they're gross. Um, but jump, but jumping back on that, the thing that, um, yes, yes, it, it's absolutely perfect. <laughs> the fact that. It plays into Lister and Rimmer's personalities again because going back to the end of last season with Me Too, um, and the the play on you know where would where would the tape be you know it would be outside of Lister's quarters outside and par- uh, confidence and paranoia and all that kind of thing, um, and then obviously Me Too with the two Rimmers getting together and and dealing with their own um, aspects, but here you've got Rimmer like. Dissing Lister for what he's wearing, he's wearing his least smeggy clothes. You've got also Rimmer saying, you know, go and get your boots. And Lister's going, but you made me put them in the airlock. And Rimmer's going, no, 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 they're fine. And it's the fact of that, 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 as Mark has said before, that brotherly connection, that, um, the personalities within them, that they're both playing off each other. And they're trying to gain points already because of the three women that they're going to see. And I think that that really works. Well, and as you say, the visual representation of these boots that you went, no, those smart black shoes that you were wearing or, or whatever they were, 
um, you know, they're not good enough. You're going to have to use the, um, you're going to have to wear the boots. Uh, no, the boots are fine. The boots are fine. And then to see them and then have Rimmer's obviously or facial reaction is just, uh, is, is a, is a wonderful playoff on, on, on that and the dynamic of the two of them. It, it's a seven or eight on the nostril scale, isn't it? It's, <laughs> it's full, fully, fl- almost fully flared. The, the space suit, it's, it, I was uh, looking into sort of things that probably weren't there when they wrote it. Just the thing of Lister didn't need to do a great deal to improve on himself. Almost he only had to put on a different T-shirt and jeans and he looks way more presentable. But Rimmer has to go completely over the top and do the yeah. thing. And then the thing to me that was sort of now the cat is on his own, essentially, in terms of cat people. And he's not with the priest or looking after the priest anymore from season one. Now he's doing things like making making space suits and things like that. So that's how he's passing his time. That I want to know who's got that suit because it's an amazing bit of outfit. I mean, memorabilia-wise, that's an incredible thing mm. to own. I know... Um, I don't know how much your Doctor Who knowledge is, but I actually know the guy who owns the Candyman suit from the uh, Seventh Doctor. Oh, was it the greatest show on earth? Is that what that one's called? No, greatest show on earth was the one set in the circus. <laughs> the Candyman was in the Happiness Patrol. That's and, it. And he looked like an evil Bertie Bassett, and the BBC got in a lot of trouble for it. But I know the guy who he bid on that suit at a Doctor Who convention, and it cost him like thousands of pounds. Yeah, it's I, I, part of me wonders if if this golden uh, spacesuit is probably it. <laughs> it may just be because it was sort of eighties materials. Whether it just dissolved over the years, yeah. <laughs> it's just come- polystyrene. It's polystyrene like sort of backpack. You know, it, it looks like it's been a a reconstituted like Ghostbusters backpack. Doesn't yeah, it? the helmet <laughs> kind of thing. The helmet's amazing. Did I dream it, or was there a red dwarf like museum at one point? Or is that Doctor Who? That's Doctor Who. There was one in Cardiff. I think it's still there. The Doctor Who experience. Hmm. There there should be a Red Dwarf one. I can't see why not. There's enough things to go in there. You know, but again, maybe some of the things like the polymorph have just just completely... I think that's why they, they changed it for Emo Hawk, is the original polymorph was like, it's destroyed, it's died. In storage. <laughs> yeah, that would have been. Yeah, that sounds likely, but also really quite a shame. Yeah, I bet you could do the display of the three. You just need to get some statue uh, skeletons, and then just put the uniforms on from the Nova Five. You could have that as a display in the Red Dwarf Museum. You could. Mm, <laughs> you could. Yeah. So Crichton greets the boys, and they follow him. But um, the cat gets stuck at a mirror because he's so attractive. Uh, Crichton asks if Rimmer speaks Esperanto and um, Rimmer (laughs) does a really bad blag and um, they finally get to the the dining room and they see the three skeletons. Crichton goes to get the tea and Rimmer tells Crichton that they're dead and then Crichton's genuinely very upset and doesn't know what to do. It's it's one of my favourite, and this is this is me quotable line, right? I often when someone comes in and says something, I'm like, "But I've only been gone two minutes." <laughs> I, I say that so much. Uh, I, it, I was watching it the event uh, last night with my other half, and before it got to this point, she actually quoted it back at me. So I think that the uh, that just it's just played perfectly. It's just the you know because I w- one of the questions I was going to ask you both is the that we get the reveal of them being dead is before we get the gag. So we get them seeing that they're they're dead and then Crichton doing his little bit and serving them and stuff and then going away. And obviously that's for that. But the reveal to us is uh, we're ahead of of it a little bit. So do you think that the two could have been put together or do you think it works better with, with the way it's set up? Because there's the setup of... Oh, he's a re- oh, he's ace. He's a big man. He's this. He's that, and that plays onto the joke first off, and then the second one is obviously the reaction of of Crichton, and and it, it's, it leaves you not thinking about anything else other than Crichton's reaction. 
I think it's better that they're they're separate, just purely from the build up of Rimmer. The sort of how 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 much he's really going for this and his reaction because it's his reaction that it focuses in on uh with the, yeah. the deep bow and the Sharmita and and that and from what I gather it was it, I think this bit was shot before the Crichton bit and they actually had a sheet up on the live thing and they dropped it as Rimmer's doing the the Sharmita so the audience see it which is probably why the reaction is so big because they've just revealed that oh they're all dead um right okay uh, well that well that makes more sense then because obviously from an audience from a TV point of view you you kind of quick slightly ahead of it aren't yeah. you just slightly well yeah, you, you are ahead of it because you've seen it before and before they get there. But th- this scene is full of prime Red Dwarf quotable, hilarious lines. And um, the, the the one that gets me every single time is, my mate Ace here is incredibly brave. Oh, that, that's ju- that callback, man. That was so perfect. It's the perfect payoff. It's wonderful. Yeah. It's had lots and lots of girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I, I don't use it anymore. I, I I wouldn't say I'd use it now, but when I was a kid, I would definitely tell my brother to smeg off dog food face regularly. I don't use it so much now, but I, that as a kid, because like you were talking about the the lack of swearing, but the creativity that I stole that at the time when I was like 15, 14, 15. Yeah, it, the thing that I like about it is the. I like the the way the cat reacts in this as well. In the he's he's initially he's not giving up. So hi baby, he's he's really not giving up. Um, but then when Lister starts doing the my friend Ace here is incredibly brave, the cat starts nodding along, <laughs> sort of just how he's immediately in on the plan to take the Mickey out of Rimmer. And I love how angry Chris Barry gets in this because it was almost like. What are you gonna do? <laughs> he's like, he can't touch anybody, but he's but he says he's warning Lister. There's not a lot you could do about it, but he's just got to stand there and seethe. But the thing is, it's so masterfully done. You've got really heavy on the gags, all the payoff, and then you've got the real, actual, genuine tragedy of Crichton's loss and how forlorn he is. It's it's so well done. Yeah, and I think the um, from a technical point of view, it, it's interesting what they do because I don't know if you if you notice, but there's a lot of Dutch angle camera camera movements in this or, or camera placements in this episode, um, in this scene in particular. Now, you could say, well, that's because the the actual ship is Nova Five is actually on an angle anyway, so they're kind of like informing you of that because you'll see that the a lot of the a lot of the tables are slightly like at a diagonal. Um, but the, using a Dutch angle and, and low angles kind of puts you in a bit of state of unease generally. But I think they they use it here as more of a like, well, how's he how's he gonna how's he gonna react to this? You know, and and I think that by by doing that, you you naturally put off a little bit, and then when you hear him de- deliver those lines, and you hear the rest of them deliver the lines, you, you're with them because you're not necessarily just like just watching it. You've got this. Like subconscious thing of like I'm not we are we are on this unsteady ship. What's going on, mm. kind of thing. Um, and I think that that works really well. And it's I, I can't think of anything before this where they would use a Dutch angle in that way. But it does actually inform the fact that this ship is actually on a on a but not a cliff edge, but definitely a crash ship. Mm. And does it reveal how long they were there for? And I think it gets mentioned in future series, sort of how he he was there for a long time. Obviously, long enough. For the crew to be skeletons, but was he there for sort of hundreds of thousands of years, or do you think he'd been there for not that long? Um, I think he, the way it infers, I think that there is like he's been there for a long time. I can't remember exactly what was said though. No, I don't think it's. I don't think it is said because. No, it goes in as well with the the sort of thing we were talking about with the the sadness. It, say, it does say it does say they've been dead for centuries. That's it. Yeah. Well, the level of decomposition would suggest that. I think. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, yeah, but I'm just saying that 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 the way that it's kind of delivered, it almost feels like they're saying, you know, are you a doctor? You know, that it's that kind of like, <laughs> uh, you, you know, it's it's like, what, what what do you mean they've been? Well, I, I've been, you know, it's, it's it, the way it's played. It, it's almost like he's been serving them for centuries mm. as well. That that's the way it can first. Oh yeah, to definitely. Anyway. He's been serving them all this time. Yeah, again, it it ties in with that thing of there's there's a lot of sadness in these first couple of episodes and the re- his realization and the what am I going to do? It's heartbreaking. He's he's been there for centuries and he's just you know it's it's finally settled in that he doesn't have to do this anymore or that he's never needed to do it. He's wasted a lot of time. Mm. Just a question on on that that scene as well because he says um, they've got le- less meat on them than a chicken McNugget <laughs> apparently. And but in American in the American ones, the muck is edited out. Yes, oh, as a different version. I noticed that on the one I watched. I think it's for the DVDs as well because it, it's very apparent that Chris Barry says McNugget. Um, but yeah, didn't spot that. But um, I'm a fan of 2000 AD and for. Donkey's years, there was a um, a red red dwarf. There was a Judge Dredd story that they couldn't republish because they took a pop at McDonald's, and McDonald's basically took them to the cleaners. Mm-hmm. And it was only a couple of years ago that they could re-release it with um, new ru- new laws on satire. They could actually re-release it with those couple of comic strips included in the story. It was called the Cursed Earth Saga, and for years it was incomplete when it was published in um, in graphic novel form. That was one of the biggest ones as well, wasn't it, the Cursed Earth Saga? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I wouldn't be surprised if McDonald's gave the BBC an elbow in the ribs for that, thinking about it. Chicken ribs. <laughs> <laughs> Muck ribs. <laughs> Oh, that's us. That's us. Cancelled in America yep. now. Sorry, sorry. I know Michelle Milbauer from America gets to listen to this, so it's um, you know, I'm I'm sorry if this doesn't get to air. I'll speak to you separately. <laughs> <laughs> so they head back to Red Dwarf on Blue Midget, and Crichton highlights that he's programmed to serve. What's he going to do? And when they get back to Red Dwarf, Rimmer completely takes advantage of this. Comes up to Crichton and gives him lots and lots of work, including. And, and, and what I like is that it includes outwitting the scutters to clean them. <laughs> yeah. He pokes them in the eyes that they don't yeah. have. <laughs> <laughs> but mean, it's two montages in one show. That's pretty ballsy. I love the the cleaning Holly's screen and Norm Lovett's reaction. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, he's brilliant. It's priceless. It's absolutely priceless. I, I actually mentioned that. Um, as we were watching it again last night, it was just like I just love that. I love that like reaction to him. He just looks down in the corner, is like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> it, you wouldn't think he'd be able to do much physical comedy being just ahead, but Norman Lovett does manage it, uh, and he does it so well. I can imagine a lot of other actors would be like, "Well, I'm just ahead. I'm just going to deliver lines and and try and do it that way." But Norman Lovett manages to work a full full performance in, even though he's he's just ahead. And that's, I think that's completely true. And I, I really like how Norman Lovett clearly cares about the part as well. He's not just kind of, you could see how someone might treat it as a vo- almost like as a voiceover gig. I, I mean, originally, that's, I think that's what he was, though, wasn't it? It was only due to him it complaining was, yeah. that it, it, without being thoroughly disrespectful to Norman Lovett, it's a really good job he's got a funny face. Because. But I think he's that dry that he would probably say that yeah. himself. So. It, it's something that I think if he if he didn't have that um, that expression that expressions on his face, I don't know if they'd have agreed to make Holly visible. So I remember I think it's in one of the books or in one of the makings of they they talked about seeing Norman Lovett do stand up, and he stood there and he didn't say anything for a good five or six minutes he's just looking at the audience and eventually people start giggling and then laughing um just be- from him looking slightly puzzled at the audience at what they're laughing at and then at the end of it he just goes what and it brings the house down and i think just the the power of of norman love sort of facial expressions and and how to use his face and his head in this case is is really on display mm. 
I agree. So Lister's on his bike and he arrives at his quarters to see that it's been completely cleaned and his laundry is immaculate. Um, and, and Crichton has even thrown away his pet mould. And um, Lister questions why he does this and why he likes it. And, um, what would, you know, what would he like to do other than this? And Crichton talks about androids. And um, he then says he also has strange thoughts when he's asleep, which I thought was adorable because he doesn't know that they're dreams. And um, he dreams of a garden. And then he shows Lister his huge tasks, huge list of tasks from Rimmer. And Lister's really quite angry about it. And I think this says a lot about um, a lot about Lister in a way that he's kind of wants to emancipate this kind of, I don't want to say slave, but this servant. Yeah, it's um, the the speech David Ross gives about the garden is brilliant. And it's something that you wouldn't have got in sitcoms at the time. I don't think it, it's the, the, it's my garden. And that's, that's what I think it's a lovely little bit of, of work. He's, mm. There's just this under underlying sadness between uh, behind this, you know, what what is externally portrayed as almost, you know, he's a he's a service droid. He shouldn't be wanting to shouldn't have yeah, dreams, he shouldn't or, have dreams yeah. or aspirations, but he has, and they're you know incredibly valid to want the garden. Um, I did love the little dance he did as well for, for singing the android theme tune. <laughs> with just his arms, I, I, I was in, I was interested if that was uh, David Ross or if that was an actual uh, direction. But it's it, it's so it endears you to him immediately, as you say, Mark. I think the um, the fact that you've got this undercurrent of slavery and the fact that of of people's rights and stuff like that, and the fact that you know, no matter who you are, you you are, you have the the right to do what you want to do, obviously within the confines of of the law if that allows you to do mm. that. Now, bearing in mind, obviously, laws back in the time <laughs> wouldn't have allowed you to do that, and that was completely wrong. So I'm not yeah, saying yeah, yeah. that. But in, in generally, in, in, in modern culture, generally, that you, you have the right to do what you what you want to do um, and aspire to do. And the fact that, you know, that he has that and he's a service droid, he's a servitude, he's a, he's a you know, he's a slave, effective, effectively. Um, and that, that's, this isn't what he's wanting to do. Whereas Crichton... In season three onwards, there's a slight different retooling of mm. that, with the fact that you know he actually wants to do the stuff that he's wanted to do, and he's, and it plays on yeah. it a bit more. But but um, but with the way that David Ross plays it, is more like you know, but I'm programmed to serve, and I'm I, I this is this is this is who I am. I don't have any things beyond this, but I do have this one aspiration, and the fact that Lister pulls that up is is. is a really good take on it. Yeah, I think the exploration of Crichton is really, really sensitively done. I've talked about um, 80s ick in previous episodes where there are things that I'm unhappy with, with my kind of like modern look at, outlook of life. But I think the way they deal with Crichton and the fact that he is mostly pretty happy getting on with the housework but he's got a few little bits and bobs that he's interested in and likes and does in his spare time. That's kind of like my mum. You know, mm. she is very happy as a housewife and always has been. And I don't feel like my mum's ever been oppressed because she can make cards. She can go and see her friends every Monday. And, and I don't even know what they chat about, probably making cards. Um, Smoking cigars and playing poker. My mother does not smoke cigars and play poker. Or, or does she? Just hard malt liquor. I hope, I hope she does. <laughs> if, if that's what she wants to do, I hope she does. But what I'm getting at is she's perfectly content and always has been being a housewife. And she's she's been that for 40 years. Yeah, my I lived for a time with my um, my great grandmother. She came to live with us, and she would go around the house. My my mother was very big on um, 
oh, what's the plate called? The blue plates with the patterns, a willow pattern. Um, so you used to get all those plates and she had loads of like trinkets and bits on shelves. And my great grandma would use to go round and, and dust and clean sort of every, every day, every other day. And she didn't need to do that. You know, she'd, she was in her seventies by that point, but it was what made her happy. It's, it was, it, you know, it, it's it's what she wanted to do. She could have done anything at that point. She was retired, but she she enjoyed going around and cleaning things. It it made her happy. Yeah, I think what I'm getting at is that it's just sensitively done. It doesn't criticize mm. people who are like that and are happy like that. Mm. It just questions people's motivations and whether or not people might be oppressed or. They're not necessarily repressed if they're happy doing that kind of having that kind of life, you know. No, definitely. Not. And like I say, I just think it's really nicely done. And, and I, I, I hate picking out eighties ick. So it is worth it when when you see something that was progressive and thoughtful and the opposite of eighties ick. I think it's worth highlighting that. It's interesting because in the same episode. Earlier on, there is a bit which kind of I I considered a bit of eighties ick was when they saw the the ladies. The cat's reaction was, "Is that female?" As in soft and squidgy. Yeah, no, there's there's a lot going on. There's I think this is going to be as we go through. There's a lot more going on in these these shows than I think we ever realised, and certainly didn't realise at the time. And I like how it works on two levels. There's kind of like the grown-up borderline intellectual level that we're looking at them, and there's 14-year-old Mark who lolled, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So the final scene is Cat, Rimmer, and Crichton in the quarters, and Rimmer is being painted by Crichton. Lister shows up, and um, he points out that he's shown Crichton some rebellious films, but they haven't made much of an impact. And so it gets to the point where Crichton has finished the picture. Rimmer has a look and he's painted him having a shit. I love that somewhere on somebody on an Etsy board or a red bubble has got to be selling canvas prints of that. Right, right above yeah. your fireplace. Oh, that's where it needs. If my partner would allow me to get away with that, I would totally have that on my wall. <laughs> Maybe in the toilet. Yeah, get a poster print and put it off. If you've got one of those, if you've got a bathroom where the toilet faces your door, put it on the back of the door so people close it, sit down, turn around, and they're facing (laughs) Rimmer on the throne. Uh, It's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. It's a great painting, though. And obviously somebody had to sit down and do that. Yeah. Yeah, I remember seeing in one of the the magazines somebody asked what's happened to that painting, and it went to uh, Mel Bibby, the the designer. The I think he was the set designer, but it's in it was in his house, so somebody did have it up in their house. Amazing, yeah, amazing. So um, Crichton says, "I think I'm rebelling," and Lister and the cat. <laughs> Fucking love it. He then throws soup on Rimmer's bed, takes Lister's bike and disappears. And then the last scene is Crichton dressed like a biker and the theme hits. It's just wonderful. Just a wonderful way to end the episode. I howled with laughter at that fucking <laughs> that picture. And then the... the, the, the um. The middle finger and just just the delivery of I think I'm rebelling is wonderful. Yeah, uh, it, there's so, there's so much in that. I, mean, I think the, um, the the one that really started to kick up. Obviously, you see the picture and it says I think I'm rebelling, and then it's the the gap in between that and it's what you yeah. got. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like yeah, brilliant. I, okay, I'm with you. You know, you don't uh, you've you've already had the setup of Marlon Brando. And the fact that he's now kind of doing what we do with Red Dwarf and actually repeating stuff like that is uh, is really brilliant. Yeah, I, I I like the say the I think I'm rebelling is a good line, but I really like the you can tell Chris Barry is barely holding it together in this scene. He he wants to laugh so hard. I, I remember watching the DVD with the commentary on, and all the way through, Chris Barry's like, "Yep." Should have refilmed it because <laughs> he's just he's, <laughs> he's, the corners of his mouth are just going up. But it, when he sort of says rebelling and then 
David Ross goes, I think that's what I'm doing. I love that. In that he he's still not really really sure. He's just got this feeling that's coming out, and he's just waiting to work out what it is. Um, and the the insults as well. I I like the fact that it's the same insults that Lister said to him earlier on. So it molecule mind, dinosaur breath, smeg smeg for brains, which I think goes all the way through the series pretty much. Um, he doesn't call him asshole, which I think really goes on to how angry Lister was in that scene earlier on that he actually cursed and called Rimmer an arsehole rather than these kind of playful insults that they have amongst each other. It's just a straight out Rimmer's an arsehole. Um, but his Marlon Brando impression is good as well. <laughs> the, the swivel on it punk. <laughs> yeah. It really is. It's a hell of an episode. And like I say, I think it's, it certainly so far has got the most lines that I still quote and immediately would recognise as Red Dwarf stuff. It's it's a great way, a great way to open series two. There's a real confidence to it. They've got their second series. They know what their premise is. They have an established cast and it's just bang, Red Dwarf's back. And I think it, it couldn't have been better when it comes to that element of the show. Yeah, I mean, this, this, there's a lot of firsts in this. There's a, the, you know, it's the first time they go off ship. It's the first um, guest star, basically, that's not that's a real person. I mean, you could argue there's confidence and paranoia, but they were imagined. They can They were constructs that Lister imagined. But this was like the first person they happened they happened across. Uh, you've got Blue Midget in there as well. Uh, which I love the design on Blue Midget. I think it's great. And it was so cramped, <laughs> which I really enjoyed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A fun a fun thing I found out when I was doing a bit of prep for this show um, was I looked into the, the makeup side of things and how long it took with it being the first time they ever really made the makeup um, and that it took David Ross eight hours to put it on. Um, but the thing I found out I thought was really interesting is David Ross is claustrophobic. Yeah, I yeah. saw that. I, I, I can't imagine doing that. Um, you know, the fact that you're claustrophobic and you've agreed to put on a mask over your head. I mean, to be fair, I I, um, I was Darth Vader for, for one of the Star Wars um, films at, at my work, and I basically went around and and I'm not necessarily claustrophobic but it was a bit of a concern to me going oh god I'm going to have to be in this costume for you know for literally hours yeah. at a time you know and, and and it was hard work it was really hard work you can't see anything I had to be you know guided around by Ray at that point <laughs> um but yeah so there was lot, lots of that going on but they it's amazing how you know once you kind of get beyond that you uh, you you kind of get used to it in some ways. It's still hard, but to be physically claustrophobic on top of that would be, uh, I, I don't know, because I know that I would get pretty much scared if I was in like a, an enclosed tunnel or something for any period of time. I don't think I'd be, I think I'd be fine for like, you know, for the first maybe a couple of minutes, but then after that, I know I would get really kind of full on and I've had that claustrophobic feeling before. So it would be interesting to see how, how, um, we yeah, because I mean, the the process of it as well would be the put a tube in your mouth. We're about to stick a load of plaster of Paris on over your eyes as well. Yeah, I think just from yeah. watching the behind the scenes documentaries, I think it's like series six where Robert Llewellyn eventually says, "Oh, we've got it down to an hour and a half now." So, so that's four, three, four, five. Yeah, this is like three, three to four series of like eight. And gradually getting less, but still a heck of a long time to to be in in makeup. And uh, I I wouldn't and I couldn't do it. It's at all. I really wouldn't be able to. I'd I'd freak out after five minutes. So for for David Ross to to put himself through that, I think shows how much he really wanted to do it. Yeah, I think that's yeah. probably fair. Yeah. And but it's I, um, it, it's mad, isn't it, that these makeup jobs take so long, but you don't even think about it until you see something like that documentary. Yeah, and it's it's a BBC sitcom. You know, you don't expect a BBC sitcom to involve uh, an eight-hour makeup job. 
you know, if, as we were talking about before, the other sitcoms were like Waiting for God, and they were probably still making stuff like The Good Life at this point and things like that. Yeah. And the, if you'd gone to any commissioner and gone, you know, this character needs eight hours of makeup every day, they were like, no, <laughs> absolutely not. Yeah. I can imagine there was a lot of fiddling around to get it into the budget, especially when Crichton becomes a recurring, we'll say recurring, a regular character. I mean, they're, they're, it just goes to show that this is the start of some fantastic makeup and some fantastic costuming, and we're seeing things like, you know, Gelfs in the future and things like that. There's some really good, like, it's, it's Howard Burden, isn't it, who's the costume designer, and he is all the way through right up until this present day. I think he comes on from two or three onwards. And he it, just some of the costuming as well is just fantastic. Yeah, it is. And there's some costuming and some things that they've done uh, over the course of it, which we'll talk about, you know, over the seasons, that that go wrong in smeg ups that, that actually make for really good, uh, really good discussion as well. So the fact that, you know, he's having to like jump around and, and make um, all these wacky costumes and stuff and, uh, you know, and try and get them to work uh, atomically as well as uh, other things as well, I think is a testament to his job. And, you know, it's probably a really fulfilling job, but at the same time, I can imagine there was a lot of head scratching and a lot of uh, pressure and a lot of, um, you know, um, worries over the course of the years that he's been. Yeah, I reckon so. <laughs> so that was Crichton, Series 2, Episode 1 of Red Dwarf. Is there anything that either of you wanted to talk about that we haven't covered? There was the Gwendolyn thing, wasn't there? So the Gwendolyn was on the end of Androids, uh, the actual t- title credits, and it gets used as a an expletive as well. And that was to do with uh, who was that again? That was to do with somebody, oh, like one of the girl. producers, wasn't it, or somebody who commissioned Red Dwarf? It's you're a total Gwendolyn or something like that, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Another sort of Androids thing is, and I know this will happen when the special comes out for it, is in the Smegazine they continue Androids as a comic strip. Amazing. And uh, I remember this from just from reading it at the time. It's it's really funny because it, it's it, it's still an uh, an overblown soap opera in the comic strip. And uh, it's I remember it being really fun. We've I believe it's somewhere in our stores we have actually got copies of the Smegazine knocking around i am going to reread them at some point uh because i i really enjoyed the comic strips because they were very 2000 ad in in the style and that doesn't some, sound like a bad thing no not at all and uh yeah they, it was it was a really good magazine definitely a really good magazine So thank you for joining us for Series 2, Episode 1 of Shipwrecked and Comatose. Before we go, Kurt, where can people find you on the internet? You can find me on Twitter at rmuldrake, that's R-M-U-L-D-R-A-K-E. I'm on the Make It So podcast, and I'm also running the X-Cast, the X-Files podcast, which is the X underscore cast, as well as the Millennium podcast, which is a spin-off from the X-Files, which is the Time Is Now pod. Carl, where can people find you on the internet, mate? Well, uh, I've not mentioned this publicly yet, and I probably will have done by the time this episode goes out. I am going to be having my own show on the We Made This Network. Uh, I am going to be having a show called Cerebral Jukebox, where I interview a guest about a song that gets stuck in their head, and then I offer to remove it from their internal memory forever, or they can choose to keep it. That will hopefully be launching or be launched by the time this episode goes out. So I'm very happy about that. Uh, If you're looking to find me online, all my projects are on one page, uh, which is at allmylinks.com forward slash Mr. Carl. And it's the unabbreviated one of M-I-S-T-E-R. And I've got everything I'm up to on there. Brilliant. And if you're looking for me, my personal Twitter is at Mark Adams HC. I also have some shows on the We Made This Podcast Network. The first one is Life's Milestones at Life's Milestones on Twitter, which is my interview show where I um, it's linked to my job as a humanist celebrant. I talk to people about naming ceremonies and birth, weddings and relationships and funerals and death. 
I'm also on a new podcast on the network called Right in the Childhood, which me, which is where me and my friend Fraser, there's a big age difference. I'm I'm um, Generation X, he's Millennial, and we look at our treasured childhood shows and we kind of see whether they live up to our memories and also what someone from another generation thinks of them. And finally, I am also on Pull or Pass, which is a weekly geeky comic book show on the We Made This podcast network, and that is at Pull or Pass. So, thank you very much for joining us for Shipwrecks and Comatosed. So until next time... (laughs) Elsewhere on We Made This. in a mortuary podcast yeah. right Rob just to laser align and realign uh, the topic of discussion yes would you like to take a dive straight in to uh, the X-Files movie for me please yes I would um, <laughs> we open on Gillian Anderson in her lingerie no sorry that's the fan fiction one isn't it that people keep talking about that you wrote um, yeah yeah I did not write and um, <laughs> I will sue you sir uh Right, yes, yeah, Sounds of the Lambs, Sounds of the Lambs. Directed by Jonathan Demi, 1991. Pretty Fly, a 90s nostalgia podcast. I think it says a lot about our humanity if we go down that road with Hannibal Lecter and if we kind of, you know, like right at the end of Sounds of the Lambs, he's going to have an old friend for dinner. And... <laughs> Which is a great line, by the way. Tremendous <laughs> it's, a, it's a movie full of great lines. An seven. old friend for dinner. <laughs> and But like, you're kind of happy for him, aren't you? Like I am. A little bit. I think it's important to remember that even someone who's a psychopath who doesn't have, or a character that's a psychopath that doesn't have that normal range of human emotions, they are human. Observing the Pattern, a Fringe podcast. Why is Nina so invested in getting Tyler back? Because, I mean, she even offers to put up the money. Like, oh, Massive, Gen- Massive Dynamics will cover the ransom. Um, so, like, she's heavily invested. And then, you know, him basically saying, yeah, I took work home with me. And so it kind of, something doesn't add up in that area. Mm. Nina's a very intriguing character because... At least up until this point, and probably well, well into season two, you you are never sure of her, her of her allegiances. Check out all of these shows and more on the We Made This podcast network. Shipwrecked and Comatose, a Red Dwarf podcast, was created and produced by Mark Adams and Kurt North. You can find us on Twitter at Red Dwarf Pod, and we are part of the We Made This Podcast Network, which can be found online at WeMadeThisPod.com or on Twitter at WeMadeThisPod. Hehehe. <laughs>